Let's start with the Edmonton Oilers and the Los Angeles Kings. The Oilers led the season series 3-1. What are your thoughts here? So when I look at the Edmonton Oilers, I think of a team that is always so close with very high expectations and is always lackluster and underwhelming. But I will admit, in the Jay Woodcroft era, yeah. the Edmonton Oilers have been a completely different animal than I have ever seen them in my entire life. The Edmonton Oilers are 14-4-2 in their last 20 games, and McDavid looks like he is having what seems like pretty unbelievably another career year. He's set to win his fourth Art Ross in seven years, which is just, it's absolutely unbelievable. Him and McDavid, sorry, him and Dreitseidel are in tune at the perfect time. Like you said, Edmonton has a 3 and one series win, will be at home, I have a tough time not taking the Oilers here. What do you think? Yeah, I I, I agree with you. Um, but let me let me get your thoughts on this. So I think we can both agree that the Leafs have maybe the most pressure in the league to win around. Do you think Edmonton second? Oh, without a doubt, for yeah. sure. Edmonton has what's, um, without a doubt, the best player of our generation. And I know that's really tough for Sidney Crosby fans, but I'm sorry. Connor McDavid, I think, will end up being a better player than Sidney Crosby will be by the end of his career. And if the Edmonton Oilers do not get at least one cup out of his tenure... That's a failure. It is way more than a failure. It is an astronomical failure. Um, There is a huge amount of pressure on them. Okay, so here's the problem I have with the Los Angeles Kings. It's the same as the Washington Capitals where they have no scoring depth. Adrian Kempe has 35 goals Hmm. on this year. But I've had him in fantasy. He's gone stretches of five or more games without a single point. If this happens here, this team is done. They run through Adrian Kempe. And I can really see this offense running dry. And Edmonton, Edmonton's McDavid and Leon Dreitzeidel just, you know, taking this series over. Yeah. And to top that off for the Kings, no doubt. True. That hurts a ton. They have... A very young decor. I mean, some of these defensemen are really good. Sean Dersey, we've heard a lot about you. He's you've been on sort of hot on him for a while, um, but they have a very it's a very young decor. Ed, Alec Edler's there, who's definitely not the player he was when he was in his prime in Vancouver. I don't know who the heck is going to match up against McDavid and Drysdale. They're on separate lines now, so I don't know who how they're going to match up. I think they they have it tough, but I do want to give Kings fans a little bit of hope here. Um, I think if the Kings have any chance of winning a series, Phil Deneau needs to put a clamp on Connor McDavid, and he's proved that he can. Last year, he did it. Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews had, I think, one or two goals combined last series through seven games, and when they shut that big line down, the um, Canadians found a way to limit the other the other players on their team, and they and they got a series win. Now. I don't think that's going to necessarily happen in this case, but if they are going to win this series, it's going to run through Deneau, shutting down McDavid, and then hoping that they can maybe limit Dreisaitl and find some goals somewhere. Yeah, very, very true. Going back to what you said about the no Drew Doughty, that is a huge hole for this team. And you know what? Even if Drew Doughty was healthy, I don't think this Kings decor has what it takes to contain Leon Dreisaitl and and, um, McDavid, excuse me. Like Anthony alluded to earlier on in this episode with that awesome interview, you know, you have to wonder whether Austin and and Mitch end up going nuclear one series. I think we can say the same thing about Connor McDavid and Leon Dreitsidel. Oh, yeah. There has to be a series where these two players look each other in the eye and go, we are two of the top five players in this league. It is time to take this series over. And I think that it happens here. And hot take, I think, I think Edmonton sweeps this series. Sweep? Yeah, sweep. Whoa. Yep. That's a big call. What, you're thinking the Kings win a game? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. But before I give my prediction, I, I want to. I have to. You know, when I'm wrong, I gotta come forward and and, and and admit it. Okay. Mike Smith, like, what the heck is going on with this guy? In April, he's a 951 save percentage. 951. 951. Wow. I was bashing the heck out of him, 
maybe in one of our earlier episodes calling him an old man with one leg. Okay, you didn't call him an old man. You called him 55 million year old Mike Smith. I, I did. <laughs> I did. I did. And if he keeps this up, there's no way Edmonton loses this series. I want to I want to say Oilers in 5. That is a little bit more conservative. I don't know. I just want to give a hot take here. I honestly think Connor McDavid says enough is enough to the media and takes it in four. I would not be shocked at all if that happened. Absolutely not. They're going to they're gonna go rogue one, one series, like you said. We didn't move on to what I think will be the most entertaining first round series. The Wild versus the Blues. This series is going to be insane. Insane. Now, what's actually kind of interesting is the Blues lead the season series 3-0. Wow. That's not what I expected, and it's going to kind of put my prediction. It's going to seem a little counterintuitive. But before we get to predictions, let's sort of break this down a little bit. What are your kind of, how are you feeling with this series? Yeah, so when I look at these two teams, I see two teams that struggled earlier on in the year and after the after the trade deadline have turned into two of the two of the best teams mm-hmm. in the league. The Wild have the second best record in the league over the last 20 games at 15-2 and 3 and the Blues are right behind them at third best in the league at 15-3 and 2. Wow. Both have insane goaltending as of late. Both have firepower offenses. We just saw a crazy stat with Ryan O'Reilly becoming the ninth player on the St. Louis Blues to record 20 goals in a single season. <laughs> If that doesn't speak scoring depth, I don't know what does. And when we look at the Minnesota Wild, the scoring depth is there as well. Kaprizov, Zuccarello, Boldy, Mm -hmm. Fiala, Erickson Eck. I can go on and on and on. The point that I'm trying to make here is that when we combine the fact that both of these teams have average at best defending, these teams are almost exactly the same. They're so similar. Yeah. So when I look at it, the only two tiebreakers I have are, like you said, the season series, which... For some reason, St. Louis has dominated yeah. them in. And number two, I look at recent playoff success. The okay. Blues, won, the Blues won the Cup in 2019. They're, they've shown that they can be battle tested. The That's Wild true. haven't won anything, unfortunately. And I think yeah. in 2018, 2020, and 2021, if I'm not mistaken, they all lost in the third round <sighs> because of that tiebreaker. I think I have the Blues winning this series, but I'd like to hear your analysis. Yeah, I, I think like like you said, on forward on defense, there's really Nothing to separate these teams. So that le- for me, that leaves goaltending. Okay. Right? And Fleury has proven that he can do it. He's won three cups. Mind you, didn't play the major role in all three, but still won them. And Talbot has been unbelievable these past couple of months since they actually got Fleury, right? So since the trade deadline, Talbot is rocking a 925 save percentage. That's not a bad backup option, right? And then on the other side, so... The, the Wild have the opportunity to have Fleury and Talbot. If one of them is not rolling, you can have faith that the other guy is going to be able to step in and, and, and do something. On the other hand, we have Huso. Huso's the, I think he's the guy going in Without a this doubt. series. He's, un, he's unproven. He's a rookie this year, right? Or he's a sophomore. He's relatively unex, inexperienced. And Bennington just kind of sucks now. <laughs> like he kind of does, right? So in this same time period that I just mentioned, since the trade deadline, Huso has a 9.12, which is average. Bennington has an 8.94. He's just not good anymore, mm-hmm. right? And so for me, that that is for me what tips this series in the favor of the Wild, in my opinion. But one other area that I think does hev- heavily favor the Blues is special teams. Wow. So... The Blues have the highest combined power play percentage and penalty kill percentage in the league. So they have essentially the best special teams, let's call it, right? Their power play is second in the league. Their penalty kill is fifth. The Wild, on the other hand, they're 21, 21st in in combined power play and penalty kill percentage, which is no good, especially when you're playing a team with the best. So I think if the Wild are going to take the series, it's going to be on the back of some stellar goaltending. And if the Blues are going to take this series, for me, it's going to come on the back of their solid, solid special teams. Um, so you alluded to the Blues. How many games do you think? Seven. Seven. I think the Blues take game seven in Minnesota to move on to the second round. I, I've been high on the, the Wild all season, if you've been listening. And this is not the time to vote against them. So I got the Wild in seven, but this is going to be a slugfest. I think this is without a doubt going to be the funnest series in the first round just because these are two firepower teams that do not deserve to play each other in the first round. No, they they don't. And the NHL is going to lose out because both of these teams deserve to make it to the second round. But, you know, 
playoff seating is a story for another day. Yeah, we'll talk um, about that at some point. 